Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. And today we have with us Brittany Becker, who is the co-founder of Scoop Industries. Welcome to the program, Brittany. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here. Hey, so tell me a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. What uh, got you started with thinking one day, you know, I could do that on my own and not working for corporate America, if that was ever the case with you? Or have you always been an entrepreneur? No, actually, I have been in the corporate world longer than I've actually been an entrepreneur on my own. So, you know, I was not one of those, you know, selling lemonade at six years old kind of person. <laughs> um, I started out right out of college uh, in the marketing and market research analytics background. I worked for a large international company working with a lot of household brands. And so that certainly had its allure, you know, as a, as a young um, professional just in the workplace. And then I moved on to the agency side doing a lot more traditional digital marketing back when uh, you know, display advertising was big and video advertising just started coming out. So I did some fun stuff there. And then, you know, I, I was very fortunate in the different corporate roles that I held that I had a degree of flexibility. So I was a consultant for a lot of these um, different clients. And I did have some level of flexibility, which I absolutely loved. And I was probably spoiled a little bit because I had that pretty early on in my career. And then I sort of got to a point, I guess, about my mid, mid to mid to late 20s, where I thought, you know what, I want to try something else. You know, corporate America isn't going anywhere. I can always come back if I want to. And so I decided to, uh, yoga was always a passion of mine. And so I decided to apply for a job managing a yoga studio and dealing with their marketing and management and all of that. Got the job and did that for a while. Absolutely loved it. Um, you know, I, it was so fun going from such a huge corporate environment to a very, you know, small, uh, yoga studio. So that was fun. And then I moved to another company, uh, in another sort of passion area, I guess, in the health and wellness industry. They were an online company, worked for them for a little while. And then as I was working for them, I was doing a lot more of digital marketing, uh, email marketing, website development, things like that. And I really kind of just started thinking, you know, this would be something that I could easily do and do on my own and allow myself to have that sort of flexibility that I've always craved. And then I decided to go out on my own. And it's, you know, as I say, the history, you know, it's all history from there. And um, within the first six months of my business on my own, we got married. Uh, we took a big RV trip kind of around the country, the western part of the country, spent five weeks in Europe, and then we moved cross country. So I certainly got my flexibility in that first, first six months of my business. Yeah, I think that's a big piece in entrepreneurialism, which is flexibility. And I'm curious, when you went from corporate America, and you mentioned display advertising and, and video and all of those things that you were doing, and then went to the yoga studio, um, what did you find that was similar, and what did you find that was very different in you know implementing some of the things that you were used to, like oh, well, you guys need this. Well, look at all this, all this I can do. Or was there some times where it was like, oh, my word, you, you guys can't do this because of whatever limitation. What did you see the differences there? Because you can say marketing is marketing, but it depends on the size of the company um, to see what all can be done and, and how um, things can be uh, laid out, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was working in corporate, we were working with budgets that are just, you know, ungodly, you know, millions and millions of dollars for one study, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars for, you know, a quarter uh, video advertising run and, you know, crazy money when you think of it that way. Then going to a, a smaller company. Now, this is a chain within a bigger company. So they did have some, you know, money at their disposal, but it was, it was honestly a bit of a wake-up call for me. I had gone from understanding, you know, we knew based on the cookies who was clicking on what ad and if they were purchasing in store and, you know, very geeky sort of uh, digital data there. And then when I remember we went into the yoga studio and they basically had no budget for mm -hmm. digital advertising, almost on purpose. They were very much focused on, and this is, I think, the difference between online companies and local companies. 
And yeah. one of the things I love about local companies, but they actually had to get ingrained in the community. So I remember one of my first days I was walking around with my assistant manager and we were literally handing out flyers on the street to yeah. people in the neighborhood walking around. And it seems really different, but I think if you ultimately understand, okay, my target is people that are in my neighborhood that look like they might want to try yoga or they look like they just came out of the gym or they're shopping at Whole Foods. You understand your market. It's the same idea as if you were trying to target someone online. It just looks different in execution. Yeah, but, you know, I would say I would, when you were describing handing out flyers, I would, the first thing I thought of was how do you know that's in your target audience? Because if you do a Facebook ad, you can say I want males between this or females between this age and that have this interest, and you, you know pretty close that there's some, some likelihood they're interested in what you have. But handing out flyers just because they are nearby your studio or, you know, maybe the Whole Foods could be a slight indication, but – what did you? At what point did you find that, guys? We'll do a flyer here and there, but boy, we got to get more fine tuned in in identifying our potential clients, right? Yeah, and you know, this is a this is a philosophy that the company, for the most part, still holds true today. Uh, a very strong focus on word of mouth and, and local marketing. I agree, it's not always as precise as what we can get with Facebook advertising. Facebook advertising was, man, if it was even around, it was, it was, it was around. It was in its infancy, infancy, right. infancy in those days. And so that wasn't anything that people really did much of, especially in a local you know, business market. So that was honestly one of those battles that I sort of did not pick <laughs> because it wasn't, it was kind of running an uphill. Yeah, um, you knew you were going to lose. That. <laughs> yeah, I was going to lose anyway. So I just focused on some of the grassroots marketing that, was, you know, and it was new and exciting to me because I hadn't really ever done it that way. It was just different, right? It was, it was interesting. Um, but it was one of those things where I, I love to be intellectual and, you know, I think oh, most entrepreneurs do. We have, you know, brains that never stop working. And I did miss some of the more intricate ways to market and do things. And I think that ultimately was part of the reason why I decided to move on. And not because they weren't doing digital marketing, but just because, you know, there's, there's only so many ways you can hand out a flyer. There's only so many yep. ways you can, you know, market um, with, a, with a free class or an open house or something like that. And it was fun. It just wasn't as intellectual, intellectually stimulating as I really wanted. Yeah, that's a, that's a really, really great point. Hey, so what do you think about when you do work with now clients that are service-based and they say, Okay, what do what do we do? You know, we we came to you, or we're interested in talking to you because we need help growing um, in in businesses called scaling. But you know, whatever you want to call it, getting new customers, increasing revenue, gr- growing. Where do you typically look at to start advising them? Because you probably, with your experience, can look and go. I can I can point out nine different areas right now, but you don't want to overwhelm them, and you don't want them to feel like they're doing a horrible job currently, right? So how do you point it out um, as opportunities? And then where do you look to start? Absolutely. And this, you know, we all have our own egos and we're building businesses and it's, it's great to be anywhere in the business journey. So when people come to us, they oftentimes it takes quite a bit of, you know, courage for them to say, I need help. I know this isn't working. I need someone else to kind of take a look at this. And typically what we find is there are for the most part, there's one of two areas that we try to figure out where we're going to focus first. So there is the um, fundamental sort of infrastructure of business. So just, you know, is it the right business model? Is, you know, is your pricing right? Is your packaging off? Like basic things that are sort of the internal sort of business strategy type thing. And then we also have what is what we kind of bucket under the marketing, right? So are you just not able to, you know, you're not putting yourself out there, you're not networking, are you not getting referrals, are you not, you know, are you not being visible where you need to be visible? And usually once we identify, okay, you know, if your infrastructure isn't in place, like if there is a fundamental problem with the business, we've got to get that fixed first. Otherwise, all the marketing in the world isn't going to matter. Um, so we kind of start there and then, you know, move on to marketing. With a lot of services businesses, we see people tend to focus you know, this is like anyone, right? You get shiny objects, there's the latest tactic here and the new social yeah. media channel there, but they tend to focus almost too heavily on the marketing, if that makes sense, without 
really making sure that all of the other pieces are in place. Um, pricing and packaging are usually two quite glaring areas. We can make a whole lot of improvement. You can actually scale a lot more without having to really do a whole lot in terms of work more hours or hire more people or something like that. So when you say pricing and pack- packaging, give us an example. What would that look like in a potential case study? Sure. So, for instance, a lot of people that we work with in our mastermind, they come and, you know, they're charging, let's say, $45 an hour for something that the market is, you know, you can, they could easily charge somewhere between, let's say, 75 and 100 depending on, you know, exactly who they, who they charge. So working to get that price increased is going to, you know, if you can double that price or even, you know, increase it by $10, $15, that is going to make a huge, you know, incremental lift over time in their business, especially for service businesses that tend to uh, have retainer type clients or an hours based package. Um, the same thing with packaging. So if there, if it's more of a package, so let's say you know you're you're coming in for a month and you are, you know, setting up a new landing page for them or something. For just an example, instead of charging it that hourly, charging that at a a more profitable package price where you're getting you know, compensated adequately for not just the actual work that you're doing, but for your expertise, for being, you know, a designer that understands what's going on, um, for, you know, knowing what copy needs to go where, and, you know, getting it done in a, you know, timely fashion. So using that package model, you're able to then just pull more profit from the same work when you move away from, okay, well, it'll take me three hours to do that. Uh, You know, if I'm charging $50 an hour, that's $150 total, but you could probably charge, you know, 10 times that if you put it into a package. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I've heard it said two different ways, um, and you might have heard one of these or both these stories, but, you know, the guy goes into the repair shop and says, my engine's knocking, and the mechanic looks at it and looks around, looks under it, takes a hammer and dings one area and goes, okay, it's done. That'll be $100. And he's like, what? $100? You just hit the engine with a hammer? He goes, yeah, well, $5 for the hit, but $95 for knowing where to hit it, right? Because it is that knowledge and expertise that you bring. And, and then the other p- element is we need to sell the cake, not the ingredients to the cake. Because if you start selling ingredients, it's like, well, wait a minute here. The flour, that's you're high priced on the flour because I can get flour down the road at this. Or the sugar, hey, you're way up. But if you sell the cake and it's a finished product and it makes the wedding or the birthday or the event all that much better, now you're talking about the package. And, and I think it is that perception of how you're describing uh, what you're doing, right? Absolutely. And that's why I, we, we never recommend, you know, itemizing things out like in a proposal or something to that effect, because it doesn't really matter, you know, how the sausage is made, just give them the sausage. <laughs> yep. And, and then when it tastes good, then they come back for more. <laughs> exactly. So what's a, what's a tip or two that you wish business owners knew about growing their business the right way? Mm, this is a great one. So I think the first thing I'm going to say, and this probably goes against some of the, I would say, popular things online at the moment, especially depending on what your Facebook news feed looks like. But um, you don't need a course or a product to scale. I think that's something that a lot of us fall prey to, especially if we're in a service industry. We tend to think, oh, well, I'm not doing services. I must be doing something wrong. And you're not. It, it just looks different. You're not doing anything wrong. I think the other the other thing is, and this is so not a sexy or glamorous tip, but really having patience. And I say this, and I often have to tell myself this as well, but patience and hard work really do pay off if you're doing the right actions, you know, day in and day out. The middle is really messy. It does not, it's not always glamorous. It doesn't look like, you know, I mean, I I kind of told you at the beginning of our conversation, you know, the first six months of my business, I was, you know, traveling around and getting married and moving and all of that. And that was very much an anomaly. That's not what, you know, every day for most business owners looks like. And so I think just sticking to it and and having the patience to see it through. Uh, And lastly, I think the thing that we see time and time again is the sort of fear of missing out that, you know, if you're a if you're someone who's been in business for a little while and you're making some money, maybe it's not as much money as you want to be making, but you know, you're making some money and you're, you know, you're moving along and you're trudging and it's slow. I think realizing that 
you're not actually missing anything. There isn't a secret that you are, you know, that you're just failing to lead or understand or put into action. 99% of businesses take the slow route. You know, there's that, you know, 1% or probably even less than that that have that sort of overnight success story that people tend to hook onto and think, oh, well, I can do that. All they did is X, Y, and Z. And so just, just realizing that it is a, it's kind of cliche, but, you know, it is a journey. Um, we're going somewhere. It's, it's not always going to be exciting and glamorous every step of the way. Yeah, I think that's a big, big piece of it, too, because it's kind of like, um, you know, I don't know, think about uh, a race, and you, at the end, you're getting, you know, you're at the awards banquet getting your award, but that's the pretty side of it. The hard side was all the prep that it took to train and then the actual sweaty, you know, during the training and the race. And that's the stuff that's hidden, you know, that's the under the iceberg. But the good stuff is, wow, I wish I could be that person getting that award. Well, you ought to follow in my footsteps and see all the hard work work that it took. And it's not something overnight and all of that. And and one thing that also comes to mind too is I'm sure when you start meeting with and working with a new client and you see all the things and let's say that they want to engage you in just a, a you know just help me out what should I do and you start telling them overall here's where we're going to start, then we move to this, then we move to this. Well, now all of a sudden you've got um, a strategy but you also have potential overwhelm and potentially you might have that business owner that would say to you, I don't have time to run my business the way it is now. And you're telling me all these things. How do I fit it in? So how do you get them uh, on the same page you are regarding efficiency, maybe time management, you know, prioritizing things like that? Fantastic question. This is age old. I think anybody in any stage of their business is always looking for time management tricks or productivity hacks. And I mean, I know I am, I love this stuff, but first and foremost, one of the things that we really try to instill with our clients, if they're not already getting to a sort of quarterly or a 90 day planning system so that they're just looking at the next three months as far as execution is concerned. Yes. You know, you can have a vision a little bit beyond that, but once we get past, you know, that 12 weeks, it's really hard to see actionably how things are going to happen. And then within that 12 weeks, realizing, okay, you're running a service business. You have a ton of your time already accounted for with your clients. And that's a good thing because you're making money, you're bringing clients in, but you still have to set aside a little bit of time to focus on your business to move it forward so that it's not a feast and famine cycle or it's not, you know, great for three months and then the next three months because, you know, you were so heads down, you don't have any new leads coming in. So coming up with one to three priorities that you're going to focus on for your business in that quarter. And I say one to three because it really, you don't want to go more than three. Um, it's, it's just too much. Um, some people, one is going to be more than enough, especially if, it's, if you have a seasonal business and it's really busy during that particular season. Uh, I'd rather see someone stick with one and, and really nail it by the end of that quarter. And then the next quarter we focus on, you know, maybe another one. And then the following quarter, maybe it's two, you know, building on that. Um, I find that when we try to do too much at once, we get, we get burned out. We kind of throw our hands up and say, oh, my gosh, this is never going to work. So why even try? Um, from a tactical standpoint, really like to set aside days to focus on your business in a given month. So ideally you're aiming for anywhere from two to three days in a month that you're going to set aside and work on your business. And for some business owners that is going to seem like, Oh my God, that's so much time. I can't possibly take that much time away. And it's definitely a habit that you have to get into, you know, you have to work that muscle and, and make it become a priority for you to focus on your business priorities. But even if it's a half day, you know, Wednesday morning from 9 to noon or, you know, Friday afternoons or, you know, depending on when your clients are most active, sometimes picking that off time is, is best, but really focusing on your business and not getting distracted during those times because there's always going to be client stuff that comes up. Always, always, always. You've got to get in the habit of blocking out your time to focus on your business and your priorities. So really focusing on one to three priorities per quarter looking at just that quarter or that 12-week time frame so that you can really see that end in sight and then just 
you know, steadily moving forward, doing that right action day after day, you know, one foot in front of the other, and just realizing that as a service business, you're going to have a good chunk of your time already accounted for by other people's demands. And so you need to set aside time to make sure your business is taken care of as well. And I would even add to that, which I agree a thousand percent, um, keeping record track, you know, a document or a, you know, checklist or whatever of these times you are working on your business, not in your business, so that you can look back quarterly, monthly or whatever and see, ooh, I did that and check that off and I accomplished that and kind of see where, what the uh, um, achievements you've done and made. And I think that will help to go, hey, Four months ago, we did this thing, and look, it's paying off. You know, we did that whatever initiative or project or whatever, and well, that's pretty cool. And that will help encourage you to continue taking that time to work on your business, not in your business. So great, uh, great conversation, Brittany. Thank you for um, your time and expertise. And what's the best way that people could reach out and maybe connect with you guys? Absolutely. So we have a podcast of our own as well, and it's focused on service-based business owners and a lot of the stuff that we talked about here today in terms of scaling and, and just being more productive and all of that good stuff. And you can learn more about that and subscribe if you want over at smallbusinessboss.co slash podcast, and you'll have all of the information there. You can also find us at scoopindustries.com. That's our agency main site, and you can see all of the stuff that we're up to there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It was wonderful getting to know you. Thank you, Mike. It was great. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.